Thank you, Michael. Um, and I'm sure it isn't fancy that. Um, that was inspiring. As you said, bad news at the start, but it got more and more optimistic towards the end, and then very, very inspiring. So we have about 15 minutes of questions. So I apologise in advance, we probably won't be able to get everybody in. Should we take them in threes? Mm -hmm. I'll take them in threes. Uh, so, um, could, could, uh, and the volunteers have got the mics. They have. They we, we think one may not work, so please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, almost, take almost one with a non-working mic chat. So, to, 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 take one put the back first. Anyone on the back row want to ask question? I'm just trying to save the, 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 the legs of my volunteer. Um, okay, coming further down. So one, one there, and then one there. One, one there. Yeah, so you talked about empowering people, and I was wondering, when you present this kind of data and you had your 54-year-old who was like, I'm going to die anyway, how do you responsibly as a researcher make sure the people who are most deprived don't fall into that ecological fallacy and think, well, it's not going to get better for me anyway? So what's the most responsible way to present that research to different types of bodies, do you believe? Yeah, 54-year-old. And there was one just behind you. Um, if you were advising a more progressive government, assuming we have one soon, <laughs> uh, what would be your top priority? Um, one more in, the, in that area? Very quiet. There's one there, Very close. <coughs> Thanks. Um, you talked a bit about uh, the difference that the strategy made for, um, from Labour. And I wondered if you could say anything about measuring those, sort of how we store up the problems for the future in terms of health, and whether there are measurement techniques for taking, you know, the um, children's obesity and predicting what that will mean in terms of their uh, life expectancy and so on. Yeah, why is it five years or a seven year lag or a ten year? Well, terrific questions, all very good, which is code for I can't answer them very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're very poor in general at communicating risk. We've got the world's expert here in Cambridge, David Spiegelhalter, who is a professor of communicating risk, and he would be the first to admit that we're not very good at communicating it. And none of us really understand averages very well and how to relate averages to individuals. The way I try and do it is in a non-technical way. This is not destiny. You can make a difference. A difference can be made that you can get off the track you're on. And that changes. Now, it may not be changes that you can make, but social changes can change the trajectory. Like the director of education in Hackney said to me, poverty is not destiny. So it's trying to communicate that this is not destiny. These are averages. Um, and none of us is very good at understanding how to relate an average to individual risk. So your question's a very good one. But that's my way of saying it, that this is not destiny. We can change things. The... I often get asked, what's the one thing that I recommend? In fact, when I published my book, I was um, interviewed on the Today program, and I went through the Marmot Six, I talked about early child development and education and employment and working conditions, having enough money, environment, taking a social determinist approach to prevention. This is what we should do. And then Sarah Montague said, well, what's the one thing you recommend? I said, one thing? Read my book. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we should do all six of them, it's not one thing. And if there's one thing, apart from reading my book, it's put equity, put fairness at the heart of all government policy. Look at the likely equity impact of everything you do. <coughs> I'm not sure I quite understood your question properly, but what I have not done, and nor do I think it would help my case, is try and create some gigantic data set that would get the whole deal in one big predictive model. 
So I'm not sure if that was behind your question. What I tried to do is piece it together. So we know, as I said earlier, we know that readiness for school is a predictor of school performance. Good data, for, particularly from Canada, Early Development Index readiness for school is a potent predictor of school performance. We've got data from all over the world that the more education, the better the health. And we've got and some good reasons why that might be the case. So coming back, if we can improve early child development, we don't have to have this gigantic predictive model to say, well, if parents cuddle their children, will that reduce cancer mortality 60 years from now? It's too hard to do that. We know that if parents couple their children, their children develop better. We've got evidence for that. So this is not saying, let's not have the evidence, but let's break it down into pieces. And so when people say to me, it's so, so complicated. Well, no, it's not so complicated. Let's look at the drivers of good early child development. Now let's look at the drivers of good school performance. Now let's look at the effect of working conditions on health. And so to take that one, and it comes back to the destiny argument. Good early child development, better education, you're likely to get a more interesting job. I don't have to s explain that to people in Cambridge that that's the case. You're likely to get a more interesting job. So then you might say, you mean it's all over by age five? Nothing to do. Well, actually, no, that's not true. Because yes, Kids who do better at age five and get more education will like to get an interesting job. But if we improve working conditions, then the people in the rotten jobs won't suffer so much. Their health won't be so bad. And there's good evidence for that. So people are not randomly allocated into jobs, more skills, more interesting jobs, but we can make the less skilled jobs more interesting and better and less damaging to people's health. Well, I think the point part of this, um, it's about 2027. So if we started now, what effects would we see in 2027? Or do we have to wait till 2037? Before, before well, I called, I called the, uh, the title of my WHO commission report was Closing the Gap in a Generation. So we did say a generation, but the evidence is that if you make, well, take the, the evidence from people 50 plus, the best predict, the second best predictor of mortality is smoking, and the best is social isolation in people 50 plus. And the evidence is if you improve social contacts for older people, you can reduce their mortality rates. And social services can make a difference. Construction of neighborhoods can make a difference. Reducing fear of crime. Subsidizing public transport. So those are things where you can make a difference really quite quickly in people who've had a lifetime of disadvantage. You can still change the trajectory. And that's why, coming back, I wouldn't recommend only one thing. Important as I think early child development is, I also think that older people have a role too <laughs> and we shouldn't throw them on the scrap heap because there's much we can do. And in my book I quote Maria, age 90, from Brazil, who said if the bus would stop closer to the curb, it would make it easier for old people to get on it. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, that's the end of my dimble being personated. <laughs> <laughs> I think you wait for the mic because it goes down. Your, word, your words will then be recorded on my mic. Thank you. I was interested that you mentioned you were talking to economists. And it seems to me that throughout this, it's the economic model that is a driver for the social inequality and the huge inequalities and disparity in wealth and the drivers to tax avoidance and evasion. So, how did the conversation with the economists go, and what is the hope for changing the economic model? That's your area. Okay, can we come further down? Come right at the front here. 
that he won't lose the mic. It's especially important for people in the front have the mic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm particularly interested in um, health inequalities for minority groups. And I was wondering whether you had anything to say about uh, particularly sexual orientation and whether the health inequalities for them uh, might be investigated further and be clarified much more by 2027. One more and say there's one there. Um, but, but, um, so, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Give somebody else a go. Um, I'm just quite interested in the fact that Japan has got the highest life expectancy, so it seems like a very good place for older people to live. But I was also interested in the fact that there's a really high um, suicide rate, particularly for children. And I'm just wondering, because they've got very, they haven't got that much crime there, they've got low um, health inequalities. But there's something going on with children, and I'm just really interested to find that out. Yeah, very Well, I spent a good part of my life arguing with economists um, to little avail. But um, I quoted the data from Anne Case and Angus Stephen. Um, um, from Anne Case and Angus Stephen. I argued with Angus for a decade, for 10 years. He won a Nobel Prize in economics. And he, like most economists, or he had a slight there, most economists, I've actually said if you show, so I've got a screening test for economists. If you show somebody the gradient and they say that your health determines your income, that person's an economist. <laughs> <laughs> it's a more accurate screening test than PSA for prostate cancer. <laughs> Here are false positives and false negatives. So overwhelmingly, it's likely. Angus took a slightly different position. He said he didn't think social conditions caused health. But he thought there was a common set of causes that caused health and caused social conditions. He suspected it might be genetic, <laughs> um, but he didn't want to go full bore on it. Well, I wrote to him after he won the Nobel Prize, because we argued like anything. I mean, he wrote me one of the toughest letters I've ever had in my life, six pages, saying, it hurts me to write this. But then, on the end, <laughs> I hoped he felt better after this. Um, so, when he won that, I thought, you know, it's time to clear this thing. So, I wrote to him and said I was thrilled that he won the Nobel Prize. We've had our differences, I said, but it was always about the science. And his ideas, and this was true, had caused me probably to think about my own ideas more than any other single person. Because, you know, he's a brilliant guy, and he didn't believe anything I said. So <laughs> that gives you pause. You can't just ignore that. You respect his intellect and his ability. And he wrote back, and he wrote me two emails back. The first was to thank me. And then half an hour later, I got another one. And with a draft of that paper that was coming out, he said, this will be grist to your mill. And in fact, their 2017 paper, he doesn't call it that because he's an economist and they'd throw him out of the club if he does, but it's all about social determinants of health. So we can get there. <coughs> Amartya Sen uh, was a member of the WHO Commission. Uh, Tony Atkinson was uh, the late, sadly, Miss Tony Atkinson was a member of my English review. So there are a few economists who don't hold to that, well, your health determines your income, your health determines your social position. And, but they're pretty brilliant, those guys. The three I've just mentioned, uh, Tony Atkinson and Michael <coughs> Sam and Angus Stephen. So if we can get the good guys, I mean the really top guys, starting to think more broadly, I'm an optimist, you know, then there's hope. So um, the second was about minorities. In our review of equity and health inequalities in the Americas, we've been asked to give much more priority to gender differences 
and to ethnic differences. It's not quite explicit about sexual orientation, but we, I hope, will say something. My own view about, um, well, let's take, because you asked me about minorities, so before I talk about sexual orientation, my own view about uh, particularly the issue of indigenous groups, like in Australia, uh, or in parts of the Americas, and in the US, the black-white differences. I talk about the causes of the causes. I think minorities are the causes of the causes of the causes. So the social determinants of health are the cause of the causes. But discrimination mm -hmm. is, in a way, a cause of the causes of the causes. So coming back to sexual orientation, I think that's what's going on. I mean, we had a debate at the World Medical Association where um, the French introduced uh, a resolution that they wanted the WMA to endorse that said um, that, I think it was something like sexual orientation or homosexual, I can't quite remember the exact wording, is a normal sexual variant uh, and is not or something like that. I can't remember the exact wording, but that was the thrust of it. And two groups debated it. The Russians and the Vatican. <laughs> Talk about an unholy alliance. <laughs> um, and the Russians said homosexuality causes mental illness. And the Americans got up and said, no, discrimination causes mental illness. The Americans right. said discrimination causes mental illness, not sexual variation causing mental illness. Mm -hmm. And that's my view. Of, now, there's not so much data on um, sexual orientation and health mm -hmm. that allows you to control for all various things. There's much more data on ethnicity and minority status of other forms. And I think that the social determinants of health apply only more so um, to trying to explain minority health. In relation to Japan, um, Japan, where is Japan? Japan. Um, in relation to Japan, life expectancy for Japanese women is the longest in the world. Maybe Hong Kong's just crept ahead just crept ahead, and it has crept ahead for men, Hong Kong, which is quite remarkable, what Hong Kong looks like, but um, Japan, now, Japan has the narrowest income inequality in the world, they do look after older people, and the suicide rate uh, is much vaunted, but it's actually about the middle of the range. You know, everybody has in mind that Sweden, they kill themselves all the time, you know, they, they so dislike a social democracy that they can't <laughs> wait to take their lives. And I tried to get how, where this myth came from. And I asked Swedish, because it's not true. It's just not true. And I asked Swedish colleagues, and apparently it goes all the way back to Eisenhower. Eisenhower visited Sweden, and he heard about somebody who killed themselves. And he said, oh, the Swedes are all killing themselves because of social democracy. Uh, but it's not true, and it's not true in Japan either. I mean, there is a suicide issue, but it's not outrageous. It's, and overall, life expectancy is very good, and health inequalities are relatively narrow. Because, because, um, the study that I just read that was um, Japan, um, with Japan have got the children between 15 and 21 had the lowest um, emotional well-being, and then we came second. But it's only one study, so yeah, it's that's it, that's difficult. I mean, if you if you look at happiness measures, then um, the French really miserable. <laughs> 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 We're so pleased that the French are miserable. Um, and, uh, and the Japanese are really miserable. Um, they don't do well at all. Uh, but there was an interesting study 
um, comparing Japanese university students with American university students. And they asked the students to compare themselves with others in their hall of residence on 50 characteristics, you know, beauty and intelligence and sociability. And, and it turns out that um, the American students, on average, you know, from zero to one, come out at 0 0.765. In other words, most American college students think they're better than most other American college students. <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly, late word ago. Um, but the Japanese come out at 0 0.50. Now, I don't know what they think, but I know what they tell the observers. I'm just the same as everybody else. I'm never going to admit that I'm more beautiful or more intelligent. I mean, could you imagine somebody who's president of the United States who says, I'm like really smart? <laughs> and Japanese would never say, I'm like really smart. I mean, if you drop a like, then maybe you might believe him slightly more. But anyway, Japanese would never say that. So I'm slightly concerned at <clears throat> style of answering the question. Um, that the Japanese do look miserable on these international surveys. They have the longest life expectancy, the lowest crime rates, low rates of incarceration, um, they look after the older people, that all these other good things, except they answer questions about happiness and makes them look miserable. <laughs> <laughs> well, apologies to those whose questions we're not going to take. Michael, we keep you here all night. <laughs> more and more interesting and important stuff. But, but I think we need to stop now and thank you very much.